Oh, this is going to be, I think, well, for me, the most unusual Mother's Day that we've ever spent together. And I'll tell you why in, uh, in just a moment. But as I was listening to the songs that um, Zach chose for today, and wasn't that great? When the time of, the time of worship, I, I just, man, I loved it. It was powerful. But every single song was, I, I think, just so geared to what we're going to look at, what we're going to talk about today. Think about these, these words from the songs we sang, grace that brought me back to the fold of God. The grace that brought me home. Grace that brought me to the fold of God. That, that song, We Will Not Be Shaken. How many of you have hit things that have shaken other people? Maybe it shook you for a while. How many of you have found that God gave you strength to stand through what you never thought you could even endure? Let me see those hands. And he gives it to you when you need it. And this one, you brought me back to life. And our story this morning is going to wrap all around that. I'm not the main speaker this morning. I'll be the interviewer. I'll be the questioner. I got to kind of be like the, the lawyer with somebody on the seat. This is going to be fun. But uh, I have been drawn, as we've been praying for and, and, uh, and looking towards this time together today, I've been drawn to those stories in the scripture of, of parents, and specifically desperate parents. You know, the Bible's full of those stories. That's another one of those things that makes the Bible very real, lifts it out of the category of fairy tales and makes it real because life gets desperate at times. And those stories about all from the Old Testament as well as in the New where children got sick, or they became tormented, or they were invaded by, by forces that the Bible calls demons that just took over and wrecked those lives. Children that got diseases, and children that died, and then, and then those parents that in desperation they called out on God. There's a story in the Gospel of Matthew about a a parent that comes running to Jesus begging for help. He said this, this force in him throws him into the fire and throws him into the water just trying to kill him. He came running to Jesus and he made the difference. He, he touched that life. There was one remarkable one where the mom wasn't even asking for help because it was too late. And she's, she's walking with the body of her son outside the, the village of Nain up in Galilee. Just, just walking out to bury her son and Jesus ruins another funeral and he turns it into a celebration and he says, no, not yet. No, not, not this one, not yet. Now, there's other people that died and other children that died during the time that Jesus was on the earth, but I, I love those scenes where he just steps in and interrupts and then there's this one. I want to read part of it to you. It's in Mark chapter 5. It's a story of Jairus' daughter. Well, Mrs. Jairus, it was also her daughter, but Jairus, when he, he discovered the illness in his little girl, he went running to Jesus. At the beginning of Mark chapter 5, Jesus has taken his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. We, we talk about the Sea of Galilee, like the Atlantic Sea or the Pacific Sea. It was a lake. It was a big lake. And maybe five miles across the portion that Jesus sailed across with his disciples, they go cast some demons out of this one tormented man. And you can imagine when the guy is in his right mind, that, that's, somebody's, that's somebody's son. That's some mother's son. And he had just been relinquished to living out in the cemeteries, just uncontrollable. And Jesus cast the demons out of, of this man. And he said, oh, Jesus, I just want to go with you. Wherever you go, I want to go with you. And he said, no, you you, why don't you just take off and tell all your friends and your family what I've just done for you. And so it says he goes on the route. He, he goes on the circuit around the area that was called the Decapolis. That means 10 cities. And it's all 10 cities bragging on Jesus. And people just marveled at what Christ has done. So Jesus sails back across the sea. And the inference seems to be that he goes back to his adopted hometown of Capernaum. And when he gets to Capernaum, verse 21, Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side. A great multitude gathered to him, and, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, I think the inference is it's one of the main dudes, one of the main guys in the Capernaum synagogue. He comes to Jesus. His name was Jairus, it says. And when he saw him, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he begged him earnestly. You ever beg God? Have you ever begged more than just sort of a quiet little prayer, you begged God, oh, come on, God, please. He begged Jesus earnestly saying, now this is gut-wrenching, my little daughter 
lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. And Jesus went with them. No questions asked. He's on board. He, he, he went with Jairus. And a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And then in verse 25 down to verse 34 is an interruption. It's another woman that has a pressing need. She's had a, a hemorrhage for 12 years. And the doctors can't do anything about it. And she sees Jesus. Now she doesn't stop him in the middle of the road and say, Hey, me first. But she does, in effect, stop the crowd because from what I can tell in the story, it says that she touched the hem of his garment. She said, all I need to do is just touch the bottom of his robe. So she must be like down on her knees reaching through the crowd as Jesus passes by, just reaching out for just the hem of his garment. And when she touches it, she's healed. Well, that stops the entourage. And I'm thinking Jairus at this point must be thinking, oh, come on, take your turn. Take a number. Wait your turn. Wait. This is my daughter. She's, she's at the point of death. But he doesn't say anything like that. And Jesus talks to the woman long enough that now a message comes back to Jesus. It says in verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? One translation says, don't trouble the master anymore. As if Jesus was troubled. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, what word? Don't trouble. Don't trouble the teacher. Don't trouble Jesus. Don't bother him. As soon as he heard that, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw the tumult. That means the riot. It was just a, a wailing and weeping and all the friends gathered around the tumult of those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And was that the case? No, no, no. The child was gone. He said, No, she's just, she just sleeping. Because that's what it looks like. And then verse 40, And they ridiculed him. They mocked him. But when he put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Would you read verse 41 with me? And then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. He said, live. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them, now this is the impossible commandment of Jesus. He commanded them that no one should know it. How do you keep everyone from knowing that the girl who just died next door is now running around in the yard and up and down the streets? But he said, don't tell anyone. Don't let anyone know. And, they, and he said that something should be given to her to eat. Remarkable story, yeah? Of, of Jesus' intervention when a father said, my little girl is sick. And Jesus just comes to that little girl and he says, young lady, arise. It's not over. It is not over. Life will sometimes get very, very desperate. And desperate people do now what desperate people did then. They run for help. We dial 911. And we dial search and rescue. And I know that typically, even if someone's not, as they say, a religious person, they still say, God, if you're there. God, if you're there. Help. Intervene. Some way. Now, you know, you, life comes with these, these random, unannounced, desperate times when you, you don't know what to do. Now, I'm not assuming that all desperate times happen when you get married and then when kids come along. But when those children come, every mama and every daddy, they want the best for their kids. And, and we kind of make these promises to ourselves, promises that we can't keep. Nothing's ever going to hurt them. Nothing's going to get past Papa Bear. We're going to wrap these kids in bubble wrap and nothing's going to touch them. And no one's going to mislead them. And they'll always be those kids for their whole life. They'll understand how wise I am. And I'll hear them say this time and time again, Oh, Father, oh, Mother, how wise you are. Thank you for such incredible, deep advice. How could I ever do anything except what you've asked me to do? 
Not. With any, any child that I've ever known, I hear they're working on one of those in a test tube somewhere, but I don't, I don't hold out great hopes for it. But accidents happen, and the toxic world that we live in invades, and sickness and disease and sometimes even death, it hits, and then we get desperate, and we call on God. We pray, whether or not we're trained to pray, right? I guess I'm supposed to be trained to pray, right? But we, we pray prayers that aren't the prayers we were trained to pray. We don't go back and, and say our, our fathers and our Hail Marys. We just cry out to God, help. It's not exaggeration. I'm not being dramatic when I say there's times when you just get down on your face and you claw at the ground. God, you've got to come through. You've got to come through. And you lift those, those children to God. You, you, you pray passionate and simple and desperate and I think effective and fervent prayers. The Bible even says it's like with groanings that you can't even articulate. You couldn't spell those words that come out of your mouth as just groaning and moaning on behalf of those kids that you love so much. Well, this Mother's Day, I want to say thank you to the mothers who prayed and still pray. And fathers, obviously, as well. But for the mothers that have committed themselves to pray and intercede and to wrestle both with God and against the devil over the lives of their children. And moms, I just want to say to you, don't stop doing it. That's what intercession is. It's fighting back against the devil. You have made a difference and you will make a difference. Don't stop praying for those boys and girls. Whether they're pre-born, whether they're infants or adolescents or teenagers or adults, wherever they happen to be. They might even be grandparents themselves. But you keep working down the, the list of names in, in your family, there's this one uh, great-grandmother here in, in our church. She said, every day I run through those names. I pray about all of them by name. Mom, don't stop praying over the tribe that God has given you. Well, today, I want you to meet a very, very beautiful young lady that has been prayed for by mom and dad that are sitting here in the second row. Uh, you know, this for, for years and years, long before the crisis hit. But Don and, and Kathy, would you guys stand up? I want to introduce you guys first. This is Don and Kathy Debro, And uh, they're sitting apart from their daughter for a reason because their daughter, Caitlin, needs the ramp. She's going to be walking up the ramp with me here in just a second. In fact, let me walk her up here. Would you welcome Caitlin Debro, who's here in the house today and, uh, and sharing her story. get this out of the way this time. This has been a long time coming. Stand right up here for a second. We're going to take a selfie. Do you guys mind if we do that? Here, turn around this way. I'm going to get on this side. She said that I was spastic. You are. <laughs> I got that from my mama. I'm just saying. I'm saying. Um, Caitlin Debro. How many of you remember Caitlin? How many of you remember praying for her? This is your family here. And for a couple of years, they've been praying for you. One after another would come to me throughout these two years saying, how's Caitlin doing? How's Caitlin doing? And I'd, you know, yeah, bring them up to date as much as I could. But how are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> She doesn't have a, a great boomy voice, but she's got a booming heart for Jesus. And, and we would just kind of want to walk you through her story. And we are going to take some time at, in just a few minutes for questions that you might have or maybe a comment, a brief comment you'd like to, to share with uh, Caitlin or with her, her parents, Don and Kathy. I don't know if Ian is here, but she's got a big brother, Ian, that's been a part of the support team now for, uh, well, obviously for his whole life, but for a long time. But I want you to look at some photos of, of Caitlin's life. How, how many of you, by the way, might have known Caitlin before she got sick. Let me see the hands of those. I know there's some way back there, right there. We met. Anybody else? So some old school friends yeah. are here with you. So I'm <laughs> going to have you come up in the light here. I know it's hot. I know it's bright, but <laughs> we'll do this. Okay. We're going we're gonna to run you through some of the phases of, uh, of Caitlin's life. That's a part of her story. 
And I've been, I, I've had almost, I guess you could say, a ringside seat to watch the development of this just for the last couple of years. And not there as often as I, I wanted to be, but just to see the remarkable work that Jesus has done. And it was a couple of months ago that, uh, that Caitlin came in, I guess a little over, uh, maybe a year and a few months ago, that you first came back to the church. She was raised here at, uh, at Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach before we moved into this facility and became known as Refuge. But from the time you were about, how old? Three. Three years old, so you kind of came up through some of our some of our Sunday school teachers here probably knew you as a little girl. I had an afro. You had an afro, <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but but then uh, she came back uh, again about about two months ago. So a little little over a year uh, between when she first came back to refuge and then and we've con been in contact since then. But two months ago when she came in and she told me, you know, Bill, I, I think I'm ready to share my story. And I, I didn't push that, but I was very excited. I kind of held down my enthusiasm. And I'll tell you why in just a little bit. It'll become clear to you. But I want you to see the, the, the Caitlin before she got sick. So this is a beautiful, beautiful young lady then, as much as right now as well. But would you tell us about this young lady? Um, I was uh, lost. I was sad. I was scared. I was lonely. I was mad. I was angry. What were you mad about? I was mad at the fact that I felt like I had no life because from the age of 14, I thought I was going to die young. I had this feeling mm. of doom, and I thought every year after 14, like, oh my gosh, I'm alive. And as the years went on, I'm like, what am I going to do now? I'm 18. Like, I actually have to do something. You didn't expect to live that long. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so I was You didn't angry. even get your driver's license, you said, because no. you thought, I just thought, like, what's the point? I'm not going to live very long. So I was just mad at the fact that I thought I wasn't going to live very long. And I so, so I took drugs and I drank and pretty much did anything that I could get my hands on just to make that pain go away for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. It was worth it. But I mean, for me then it was worth it, but I didn't do anything. It made me more mm -hmm. cold and more hard. And... I was so angry that I got into boxing and kickboxing and I thought, okay, that's going to get some anger out. That's going to get some issues out. <laughs> and that didn't work. That made me more hard and colded me even more thinking, okay, now I know what to do. If someone mm -hmm. steps up to me, I can knock them out. And <laughs> right. <laughs> and <laughs> Is this a safe distance? <laughs> So I was just lost and sad and mad. Now, you had, um, it, because this is a part of the story, too, that as a, as a girl, as a little girl, you had gotten into ballet for a while. Yes. And then into another kind of dance? D uh, tap dancer. And, and tell everybody how that related and how that kind of prepared you for where you are now, along with the kickboxing. Well, kickboxing and tap dancing, ballet, you're all on the balls of your feet. You're always on your tiptoes. I grew up walking on my tiptoes, and my mom and dad thought I had a short Achilles tendon or something. And they're just like, no, she wants to walk that way. And so found out after I lost my arms and legs and I got my prosthetics on my legs, that's exactly what it feels like to walk on prosthetics is on your tippy toes. <laughs> so he's prepared me from day one. <laughs> somebody told me after the first service that uh, they were talking to somebody else that had been through uh, bacterial meningitis. Yeah. And they, they said that uh, whatever it, it, it was not in, in their life, that the set, there was something that was like a setup that prepared them for the setback. And it was almost like God was setting you up with the skills to be yeah. on your toes for what would appear to be obviously is. You know, physically, yeah. it's a setback. But God was, was way ahead of it, knowing what oh, was yeah. coming for you, not <laughs> letting you take your life, not letting you drink it, drink yourself to death. Or, and I just, I am so grateful for, for what he did. So this was the angry, empty Caitlin. Yeah. And about up till 18 years of age, right? Yes. Okay. Then talk about what happened on February the 12th. Um, I got back to Roman and 2013. Yeah, I got bacterial meningitis, and um, that first morning, I uh, couldn't really get up. I did, but it was really wobbly. I was really dizzy, 
And I would go to my mom because I just started a new job and I was like, I don't want to miss my, my work and I don't want to make a bad impression or something. And I just, I couldn't do it. I was like throwing up and I had a fever. And so I just took Advil hoping that would take help somewhat. And um, within 12 hours, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't walk, I couldn't move. I had bruises on my face, I had bruises on my thighs. I didn't mm. do anything for them to get there. And um, my mom was like, um, how'd you get those? I was like, I don't know, I just have them. And um, she had to call the paramedics and they uh, took me down the stairs. They had to like pick me up out of bed, put me in a chair thing and walk me down the stairs because I couldn't walk. It was just done. Mm. And then she went from one hospital quickly over to UCI up yeah. in, in Orange or Santa or wherever that is. And you were there for how Six many months? Six months. Six months. And then from there? I went to rehab for two. Two months. And there's a few pictures that, uh, well, a lot of pictures that Caitlin had sent me that we couldn't put up on the, on the screen today that will probably show up in, in medical journals and files and comparison files with, with what meningitis actually does to, to your body and to your... Now my brother had passed away from the same disease but without what you had gone through, without the amputations and, and all of that, but there's a couple of pictures that uh, we wanted to show you and this was... How, how far in do you think to the... Probably a couple months, probably one or two months because I still had my hair. Yeah, so yeah. And you've been through how many surgeries so far? 23. And a couple more to come probably yeah, with, with this arm? Yeah, they want to lengthen this arm so they have to break it and then put screws in it, put like a cage around it and screw, like turn the screws a centimeter, millimeter every day until it just grows. Wow, and, and that will be for another prosthetic on that side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, T tell everybody what happened over here. Um, I had to get another surgery um, because my elbow tried to grow itself back, but our bodies aren't meant to do that. So they had to shave it off and so it could fit my prosthetic better. Wow, wow. So, how, how many of you knew some of this story, obviously, that um, the whole left arm that we were praying, when I, when I first came into the hospital, um, she had lost her arm just below the right elbow and they were praying that she could keep you know that that movement and it wasn't possible so she had just lost that and both uh, legs just below the knee and that would have been enough to just cause a lot of people to stop to give up this girl doesn't give up something I'm learning about her she just doesn't give up I uh, I, I say this. I say this a lot, and uh, I'm sorry if you've heard me say this before, uh, but I don't need storybook heroes. I don't need comic book heroes because I get to live among real heroes. That, in spite of what life throws at them, or the devil throws at them, whatever the source, they they get up, deal with it, hit those speed bumps. Sometimes it's like a mile of, of nothing but speed bumps. Yeah. But they just keep going, and you, you your story, I tell you, your story and your life just really give me a lot of courage. Uh, tell everybody who this is. I'll circle it up here. It's a little bit dark. You know, this little figure out here. Um, that's my baby. Her name is Lucky. She's a pit bull and she's... That just makes sense <laughs> that you got a pit bull. It just makes sense to me that you... She's super sweet. She, she has scared me, me on more than one time when I came to your front door. Yes, yes. Yeah. But tell, tell everybody the setup for this picture. Um, they, I had no skin, so I wasn't exactly up for doing much. And um, the people were like, oh, let's go outside. Let's go do something. You need fresh air. And I was like, no. And um, they're like, well, we have your dog. And I was like, fine, okay, <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> we'll go see Lucky, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that meeting with Lucky? Mm, kind of. I remember she was spastic. <laughs> I like so. that. <laughs> um, as we've talked about those, those horrific months in the hospital and then in rehab, it's very obvious that the gods sort of gave Caitlin a little merciful memory lapse of that time and she doesn't remember a lot of the extremely painful procedures and the cleaning of the wounds and all that as well, which is, was probably as, as, as horrible as, the, as anything that you went through. Yeah. But you had a conversation with Jesus that began right when you got sick. Why don't you tell everybody 
how that that first little uh, exchange between you and the Lord went. Well, like the first 24 hours, um, I heard, I didn't hear, I mean, I felt it. Like he talked into my spirit and my heart and it's just like I knew and he was like, do you want to live or do you want to die? We always have a choice. And I was like, I want to live. And he, like now that I think back on it, years later, he was asking me, do I want to go to heaven or do I want to go to hell? We always have a choice. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. And it's just, it shows that he's always like Mm -hmm. been there. Mm -hmm. Even though I went out drinking and doing drugs and not even making him happy in the least bit, and yet he still wants me to go to heaven. He still was like, I want you to go to heaven. He loves like, you. Yeah. yeah. That's overwhelming, isn't it? To realize yeah. you look at your life. How many of you have a story like that? You look at your life and you thought, why would he love me? Why would he even want me? After what I've done with the life that he gave me. But yeah. wow. Um, so this conversation starts with you and Jesus. But you're not really at the point yet of saying, Lord, you can have all my life. And I'll leave this yeah. hospital and live for you. But you were very, very aware of him. And, yes, and, I was. Um, one of the first, uh, um, uh, I, you know, I, I kind of arranged this a little bit, but one of the, uh, maybe a couple of months down the road after, you know, we had first got reintroduced to one another, I was able to um, get a hold of Nick Vujicic and ask him to come, if he would please come and visit her. And I asked him right away when, when this first happened, and he said, I can't get there. I'm leaving for this and that. And the schedule was just so impacted. But he said, you know, Bill, it would probably make more sense if I come in like June. And uh, he, he said, because by that time, she'll be through, you know, with the loss. And then she'll, be, she'll realize, well, this is what I have. And maybe that would, would make more sense. And I think it probably did. So that's Nick on the, <clears throat> on the right of the photo. And family gathered around there, too. But I love this picture of Nick and, and Caitlin. And I don't know what they were saying to one another. I don't know what, <clears throat> excuse me, Nick was, was pouring into, you know, Caitlin's wounded heart and body at that moment. But it just had hope written all over it and compassion and such love. It was just overwhelming. I, um, it, it was during this visit and it might have been right around the time that uh, Nick was signing her book for her. <laughs> Isn't that great? Nothing stops this guy either. Life Without <laughs> Limits is uh, the name of his book. But um, I, I was trying to say something pastoral and something <laughs> encouraging. You know, I got to say something, right? I'm a preacher. I'm, I'm paid by the word. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. But um, I, I wanted to say something that would encourage her. And, and so I'm standing back. Basically, from the angle of the photo there, over uh, Nick's shoulder as he's looking at that time at Caitlin. And I said, you know, Caitlin, God is going to use you in, in some remarkable ways to bring hope to people. He's going to use your story in great ways. And Nick looks back at me almost as if to say, hey, Bill, shut up. You know, but kindly, you know, gently. He would never say that. And I tell my kids, don't say that. But I think he, went, he said, Shh, no, not yet, Bill. But then he turned back to, to Caitlin and he said, you know, he said, Bill, that's probably true that God will use her. But what Caitlin needs to know right now, and he looked right at you and he said, you need to know that Jesus is with you. Not what's down the road, but what's happening right now. He was with you. And you know that yeah. as you look back, even before you had responded to him with your whole heart, right there he was, you know, know. like little girl, little girl arise and he's he was giving you your life back it was in it was in the balance at that moment this is Caitlin after they had taken her beautiful hair they had to take the scalp for skin grafts how, how much of your your skin needed to be grafted well 57 percent of my skin was gone and then the rest they had to like grate it off and then perforate it and put it on the parts that had no skin so. wow wow there's, there's kind of a funny story. The other two services didn't get to hear this, but she had a tattoo in one place that is now in three different places. <laughs> it's like a puzzle and the, the pieces floated around. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, another powerful thing that, that I saw, and many of you saw it as well, 
on uh, Channel 4, Vicki Vargas, I think she's on Channel 4. She'd come in and done a couple of pieces on, um, on Caitlin. But the first one that aired, Vicki had said something to Caitlin, uh, I guess uh, about her faith or whatever. And Caitlin said, well, you know, God answered my prayers. And you're looking at, at a young lady that's in, in this condition, and it is actually, I think, before the, the scalp was taken, you're, you're looking at this young lady, and, and, and Vicki asked the question. I'll play Vicki, and Caitlin, you play Caitlin, okay? Okay. But Vicki said something like, well, how did he answer your prayer? I said, um, I didn't ask to have arms and legs. I asked to live and to be saved for eternal, eternity. I didn't ask, like, yeah. oh, revive my arms and my legs so I have them. I was just like, dude, let me live. Dude, <laughs> dude you, I guess, dude, God, dude, let me live. <laughs> he understood who you were talking to, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, when I was 18 years old, I was looking up to the heavens talking to Charlie. I didn't want to say God, so he understands dude as well. <laughs> and he ran to you. He gave you what you asked for. He gave yeah. you life. So then six months at UCI, two months in rehab, dad hovering and pacing, walking around UCI, meeting all the homeless people and speaking into their lives and them speaking in him, writing book length posts about how proud he was of you and what God was doing in you and how you were actually speaking into his life at that time. Any of you that have followed Don's posts, you know they're not brief. They're, they're just a, a flow of what's going on in his heart. And mom, they're in the hospital. T tell everybody about mom here on Mother's Day. Well, my mom's my best friend, as she knows. And um, throughout the six months of UCI, they had like this little itty bitty tiny bench looking thing under the window, maybe a little bit bigger than that thing. And she would like curl up on it, go to bed, never left my side all night for six months. And then she never would, went home yeah. to sleep in her own bed. And so then... In the morning, at like five in the morning, every morning, I had to get like a chest x-ray. She'd be like getting up all like, I don't wanna get up and like have to stand in the middle of the hallway. And then at um, rehab, she stayed there as well. And it was like this pull out chair thing that was hard as a rock. And she's sitting there all like crippled, like I can't walk. <laughs> so what do you wanna say to your mom here on Mother's Day? Well, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty obvious. <laughs> Now this, this phase of your life, I didn't, I didn't really know about this until you sent me the, the photos. Mm -hmm. I think I had a, a, an inkling, as they would say, but I didn't really know until you articulated what, what was going on at this point in your life. That you, you're, you're home, right, at this point? Um, that was actually in rehab. In rehab? The next one, I was at home. I, um, what do you see in those eyes? I see nothing. Eyes? I see emptiness. I see sadness. I see scaredness. I see that person before I got sick in those eyes because I wanted to continue to drink and to smoke and do drugs because I didn't want to admit what had happened to myself. I didn't want to be like, okay, I have no arms and legs, let's work on this. I was just like, I want this gone for 30 minutes, however long it lasts, and then drink some more, smoke some more just to get rid of it. Mm. And whenever it would wear off, it would just slap me right in the face and be like, you have no arms and legs mm. and I'm like okay so then I was friends with this girl she didn't hold me down and be like you need to do this you need to do that I went along with what she was doing and I wanted to do the things as well but I it was the day after my birthday I stopped being friends with her and I don't know I God was just like hey cut this off so it's like okay and I cut it off in June 8th I was, I received the Lord. I was mm. just like, I want you in my life. Mm. I want you in my heart. I want you to fill the cracks in my heart and mend my shattered heart to make sure, or to like show that there was no even any shatteredness in the beginning, yeah. if that makes any sense. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think in, in a deeper way, that was the day that, that Jesus came and, and yeah. said, little girl, arise. And he gave you life, now, yeah. now eternal life, and you were ready to run. Now look at look at the look at these eyes one more time. Now watch these next pictures. These are my favorite. Here we go. Look at that. <laughs> 
Look at that. That was at, uh, uh, at a vineyard church down in Newport. The guy is Carl Tuttle, a very, very good friend of mine for about 44 years. And I just love that guy. And I was so thrilled to hear that you were going to be over there. A little jealous that you spoke there first, but I'm over <laughs> it. Um, and, and there's mom going, going crazy over, uh, it's just, I don't know what, what it was that put the, I know Jesus put the joy in your heart, but uh, then these. Um, and a, a selfie, right? Yeah. And, uh, but look at the face. Even, even through the mist, look at the joy in those eyes and these ones. Um, just getting started. It's a new journey, a new direction, and a new life in Jesus. And you can just see it. You can see it in the countenance. So what, here, here you are, a young woman with, without feet, without a left arm, with half of a right arm. What do you have now that have- you didn't have then? I have Jesus, and someone asked me, don't you miss anything? And I was like, no, I'd rather have a life with Jesus without arms and legs than have arms and legs without Jesus. Amen. Amen. What are... (laughs) What are you discovering now about, you know, the depths of this relationship with Jesus? How would you describe him to somebody else there's probably you know people young people and not so young people out here that that haven't decided maybe they're at the same place you were okay I know he's there I've got him on 911 I'll call him when I need him but haven't said okay Jesus take what's left of my life what would you say you're discovering about Jesus that you just wish you had known how deep that was before well the love because I was in love with this guy for six years and I always looked to him for what Mm. Jesus gave me and it's just love and care and just, oh, I <laughs> can't even put it into words. It's just amazing. He's crazy, mm-hmm. but he's the best crazy I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> he's crazy in love with you. That's for yeah. sure, yeah. Um, I think that to, to me, the bottom line of, of your story, and it's, I think it's the bottom line of all of our stories too, is that when you see Jesus put his hand on, on a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, it's him saying, devil, you don't get this one. Yeah. You don't win. This one's mine. And he fought for you. He fought so hard. In fact, when you compare your scars with his scars, his scars were the, the scars that bring the healing on our scars. We're all scarred, aren't we? Aren't we all kind of beat up in one way or another, whether it's, it's obvious and visual or it's invisible? It's, the, it's, it's his scar that just conquers our scars. And mm-hmm. did, did, did you already talk? I can't remember what we said in what service. Did you talk about the question about your scars? Uh, Somebody I asked you? I think so. Well, I know someone asked me, like, do you want to get cosmetic surgery on your scars? Like, to get them taken away. And I was like, <laughs> and no. I earn these. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they're a testimony, too. I mean, when you, when you look at, at those scars, there, there might be times when you think, oh, I wish those weren't there. But, and, and by the way, um, if you had those moments of uh, feeling sorry for yourself, I never saw them. But you, you declare now, and you, you, you told me before we you came out, that uh, those days are gone. You, there's, yeah. there's not any self-pity now or feeling sorry. That everybody else feels sorry for you. I know. There was a guy here last night that just about wept on her shoulder <laughs> over how sorry he was. But, but she's not living in that. But you're living now with... The, with these new goals that keep, I mean, I, I got to go back to this one picture. I didn't say this. Okay, keep going back right about there. See the little pink thing <laughs> right in the middle of the picture? That pink, uh, get orange or pink? That's a cell phone. And she's texting without fingers with a little bump that was on the end of this, uh, this, this arm there. And I remember the moment I watched her using a cell phone like that, thinking nothing's going to, nothing's going to stop her. Went out to a, a restaurant last night with the family, and because she can't use this, she is texting with her nose. <laughs> uh, we were going to do a, a selfie and have her post it with her nose, but we'll do that afterwards. But <laughs> nothing is going to stop her because now the, the power in her life is Jesus. And, and your, your story, Caitlin, it, it, just, it brings hope. It, it, bring, it, it really does, like I said, it, it gives me courage to watch a young woman like you that says, no, this doesn't win. No, this doesn't stop me. Is there any, anything else that you'd like to, to speak a word of encouragement to those that are here today? Um, 
people that might be facing those, some of those kind of challenges as well. To not give up. I mean, it's typical. Like, people say that all the time. Don't give up. But really, don't give up. You've earned the right <laughs> to say that. <laughs> You've earned the right to, to speak that to us. I, um, now, you have another... She has a, a, another goal. We're wearing shoes that almost match. I did that on purpose today. <laughs> but um, she's got a goal. Um, and she is on, on uh, prosthetics now. But I tell, tell everybody one of the hardest things for you to do is. To get in the car because, you know, like that airbag thing or the thing that goes underneath that you put things in. Like my feet don't bend. So I'm like sitting there like, <laughs> get so, under there. <laughs> so she's got some plans. Tell everybody about your, your, uh, one, one of your plans in the future. I want to be a sprinter. So. I want to be a sprinter. <laughs> How many of you would like to help her become a sprinter? Would you like to do that? Um, we didn't. We didn't. In, didn't plan it this way. Uh, but when she said, she told me about wanting to get the blades be, because to be a sprinter you need those you know those blades that you, you see L things. what were they the L things the L things yeah <laughs> and uh, and they're expensive and uh, I want to give you the opportunity of helping to make that a reality you don't need to um, to, to grab one of these if if, you, if you're not going to wear it please don't but out at the info counter there are hundreds of these uh, the folks in the first service you know scooped them up quickly but for whatever donation you'd like to give towards helping Caitlin get, uh, you become a sprinter and get those other prosthetics and just kind of, there's, there's costs all along the way. So if you'd like to be the family behind her that helps to make that happen, on your way out, turn right. Before you turn left, she's going to be out in the cafe. Give us a chance to kind of get out there and let her sit down because she's been standing a long time. <laughs> but she'll be out there and take some time to talk to you. And I'll tell you, it'll be encouraging to you. And, and you can hug her. She doesn't break. She doesn't break. I'm so, a hugger. Yeah, she is. And so you, you can do that. But I, I want to close by praying for, for families here today. Moms and, and dads and, and maybe your children that uh, maybe you're still praying for them to even come to Jesus and discover how amazing he is. And uh, maybe you've never said to God, God, here's my kids. They're yours anyway. You gave them to me, but here's your kids. We're going to pray for Caitlin, but I also want to pray for you and your children and your household that God would do a remarkable work, something that no man can do. Why? How can he do it? Because he's risen, because he's alive, that he would say to your son or to your daughter, little boy, little girl, arise, come to life. And that he would keep you from wasted years as you, uh, as you pursue him and understand that that's the key to life. What, you've, what you don't have if you don't have Jesus, you don't have Jesus. You don't have life and forgiveness. You don't have that grace and you, you need him. He loves you. And I want to pray for you right now. So could we all stand? The worship team is going to come back up. And, and uh, let's thank Caitlin for sharing with us today and pouring out your heart three times. Oh, oh, we didn't, uh, we didn't get to the Q&A. Does anybody have a quick question? Yes. If you're familiar with the uh, Challenged Athletes Foundation. Yeah. CIA. Great. Challenged <laughs> Athletes Foundation. Get with that. Okay. Get, my okay. sister-in-law is 68 and she's running triathlon. Oh, praise God. Get us the information for that if you don't already have it. Anybody else? A quick question. Anybody else? A real quick question? Yes. Amen. From UCI as spiritual care over there. And this girl is a fighter. Yeah. I remember you. Yes, <laughs> we met there. Good to see you were a huge part of, yeah. of your support team. Oh, bless you. That's right. That's right. Yeah, uh, uh, something angel. Yeah, angels of love. Angels of love, yeah. Anybody, anybody else? A, a question real quick. Sorry. Uh, yeah. How many cases are there like this in the United States? First time I've heard about this. How many cases? Mom. <laughs> uh, uh, there's about 2, here. Wow. So it's, it's not real yeah. Anybody want to shout out a word? How does the story hit you? Just one word. You're amazing. You're amazing. Another word? Wonderful. Victory. Victory. Courage. Yeah. Thanks for not giving up. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for my sister. And Lord, I thank you for your victory in her life.
I thank you that you gave her a praying mom and dad and a growing circle of intercessors all around the world, Lord. And Jesus, I thank you for the way you are glorifying yourself through your little girl that you called back to life, that you commanded her to arise. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love for Caitlin, Lord. And I pray that you would just continue to encourage her, provide everything that she needs, Lord. And may her life, her heart, her soul be filled to just bursting overflow of your goodness and your grace and your truth as she goes deeper and deeper and deeper in love with you. And Father, I pray for the, the children that are represented here with moms whose hands are raised before you. For you, God, to likewise do a great work deep in the hearts of their boys and their girls. So, Father, would you apprehend those hearts and draw them to you, Father. Show them the emptiness of life without you and how full life is in Jesus. We thank you, God, for showing us your presence right here in our midst today in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Before we sing, um, before we sing, I, I, I think one of the, the images that will always be etched in my mind is when I, I was walking in here around the corner and, and we were in, that, I think that song about forever you're glorified. And I walked up behind Caitlin and she's standing there with her arm in the air, lifted to Jesus and saying, God, I pledge allegiance to you. <laughs> I'm yours. So whatever you got left, use it for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Use it for him. We're going to worship and then we're going to go. God bless you. Thank you, Caitlin, for being with us today. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.